but that was good for us to be able to break it down and look at it in a, in a practical sense. I'll just tell you from my own experience, but something small. For many years as a Christian, I blamed a lot of things on Satan. And I blamed a lot of things on the world. Because I didn't really understand the flesh. So I said, oh, you know, Satan's doing this, and Satan's doing that, and Satan's doing this, Satan's doing that. And he does, he does lots of things. And a lot of times I said, oh, you know, the temptations of the world weren't so strong, and they weren't so appealing, and those sorts of things. And I blamed things on the world. But I really believe, brothers and sisters, that last night's topic, the topic of the flesh, um, it is... It is the hardest, it is the hardest to accept, but once you do accept that it is dead, then it changes your whole life. It was funny last night after we had, when we were having our um, Bible study, right? And, um, it's always like it, it's always good to see the um, to see the believers when they fellowship with one another. And even though um, we're hot tempered, many of us and should I leave? Even though like we're hot tempered and we get passionate about things and we we have fun. Yet I'll tell you, unless you've actually tried to do that sort of thing, not by categories, with non-believers, you'll realize that their way of fun is quite different. It is different. When you guys gather together at this conference, and you spend a week in fellowship one with another, this is different than you spending a weekend away with unsaved people. It's, it's different. And that difference is not the devil. And that difference is not the world. That difference is the flesh. You think about last night and you think about you know, how just think about like the morning. I'm, I'm hoping that in the morning when breakfast was served that many of you would have thought to yourself I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to complain. I'm going to eat what's, what's there in front of me. When you woke up this morning and you thought I can't wake up to have my fire. I'm so tired. That's the flesh. When you say, I don't have time for God, that's the flesh. When you say, I don't want to go to the meetings, that's the flesh. It's not the new man, because the new man desires the things of God. It's the flesh. And if you can just but begin to be sensitive to how much the flesh shows itself in your life, you'll begin to notice and be able to say, no, 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 wait, shh, shh, lock him up. Be quiet. That's not from the new man, it's from the flesh. But we have to talk about the world. Because tomorrow, I don't know about you, but I'm back at work. I'm going to be surrounded with unsaved people. You are going to be also either back at work, you go back to studies or you're on holiday. Right. Holiday, studies, studies are on. So you're going to go back to your studies, you're going to be surrounded by, again, unsaved people. And you're going to be surrounded by the things of this world. As soon as you get into your car and you're on your way home, what are you going to be listening to on your way home? As soon as you get home, I know that most of you will just find that soft mattress and dive into it. Okay? You won't even bother about unpacking. Forget unpacking. Just let the stuff rot in the bag for a while. And we'll, just, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll worry about that later. But first we've got to get some sleep. And then you wake up and you think to yourself, okay, well, what am I going to do? Where's it exactly? And you're going to find yourself right, oh, that, look, it's been a tiring week. I just want to relax. So you go and you find the remote and you sit in front of the TV and you sort of say, where's this card? I'm just going to sit in and wear some trackies. I'm going to sit on the air and your watch, whatever's on, on TV from 8.30 to about 10.30. And then when I start to doze off and I get tired, I'm just going to go to sleep. Don't get upset. But that's the flesh. Because you know what the new man would do? The new man would say, you've just spent time with your brothers and sisters. You've opened the word of God. 
You spend time there with the Lord. And the Lord has spoken to you. Would you not take that and think about it and meditate upon it? And instead of turning that TV on, instead of going out, instead of doing those things, I'm not saying you should stop doing those things, I'm just saying instead, spend time with the Lord. In the quietness of your room, find a quiet spot. And just sit with him. Talk to him. Tell him. You know, Lord, my struggles. You know what's difficult. You know that it's hard. But sit with Him. Sit with Him every day. Sit with Him in a common place. Sit with Him in a quiet place. But sit with Him. You must sit with Him. You must. Or else, you've come and you've listened to messages. Spent a weekend away, and all it is is just cost you some money, and that's all it is. What you want, what what God has shared with all of us over this weekend, He has invested in our eternity, not just in our life. Alone. But let's talk about this world. Unfortunately, let's talk about this world. One day, it will be a thing of the past. You and I will be standing there. Moses will be beside us. And we're going, Moses, remember that world? He goes, oh, don't tell me about that one. That's ancient. I was there. I saw them take the people of God and turn them into slaves. That's what the world does. It beat them. They didn't work for a wage. They didn't have even enough. At one point in time, because even at the time of my birth, the world was so against us, so driven by Satan, that they turned around and said, that's it, kill every male child under a particular age. And God rescued me. And Moses will tell us about that, about God's providence. And then I'll turn to Moses and I'll say, Moses, you know what? It's the same thing. Like we used to come home and we used to come after the meeting and the first thing we do is just flick open the TV. Now Moses may not have then known what a TV is, but basically it's this box, Moses. And it's just the world just fed you. It just fed you. Because you didn't want to think for yourself. You just wanted to be entertained. And Moses would go, oh, that's horrible. That's horrible. But then you're going to get someone like a Daniel. Now if Daniel's there, we're going to have a bit of a problem. Because Daniel comes and he stands beside us and he goes... Yeah, I was, I was in the world. I remember I was in the world when the Babylonians came and they took us captive. And then King Nebuchadnezzar wanted to select all these young men. And he turned around and he picked us because we, we looked healthy, we looked strong, and we were smart. And he picked us and he chose us so that we could help him. But then he puts in front of us all these foods and things that we're not supposed to eat as God's people. But I thank God that when I looked at that food, I said to him, we will not defile ourselves with that food, King Nebuchadnezzar. And you know why? The Lord who will be there will say, because Daniel purposed in his heart to not defile himself. Have you read that verse? Do you know where it is? Shall we open it? Let's read it. Let's read it. Daniel chapter 1. Have you sitting there thinking to yourself, where's Daniel? He was learning the two verses in Isaiah 53 for Sunday school, but he was wounded uh, for our iniquities, and he was, uh, and she was. I was trying to teach her where that sat in the Bible, that the Bible was made up of two books. So I told her, "Do you know where it sits in the Bible?" So I think she picked the book in the New Testament. Can't remember what it was. I said, "No, no, that's that's the that's the wrong side. You've got to go to the other side of the Bible." She was here, but it was close. <laughs> so sometimes us as Christians go, look, as long as I'm opening the Bible, I don't know where it is, but somewhere in there. Right? It's between this black cover and the other black cover, but that's all I know. Okay, verse 8. But Daniel, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs 
that he might not defile himself. But I want you to notice something about verse 9. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. There are times in this world when we're afraid to say no to the world. But we have to trust and believe from all our hearts that God will give us favor in the sight of this world. God will look after us. Now you know the story, don't you? The story was basically eat this food. The reason they have to eat this food because it was measured. The food was the best selected food. It was the healthiest food. It was food that would make these young men stronger and wiser and more alert. Better for the king. So if they don't eat of it, they, there's no way that they could be the people that the king wanted them to be. So Daniel says, well no, we're not going to eat that because that breaks God's law. But we will still do the right thing. And we will turn around and do that which the king wants us. So you give us what we asked you, which I think was like bread and water or something, or something, some, some sort of porridge or something along those lines. We don't know exactly what it was. And some water. And see not in ten days if we are not healthier. If we are not better than those that have sat there and ate at the king's table. Now, I know that many people don't like looking at the scriptures in a literal sense. But I want you to know something. For 10 days, how much could change in 10 days? 10 days, that's all it was. Not months, give us months and then look at our physiques after we're done. No, 10 days. 10 days was all it took to prove that they would purpose in their heart that they would not touch the king's stuff. And that they would be better than the people in this world. Not better as in, not better. They would be spiritually closer to God, healthy. Their mind thinks better than the unsaved mind. They have a direction, they have a guidance, they have a purpose, they have a hope. There's problems that occur. Tomorrow you might go and suddenly they're talking about, we're going we're gonna to change this area, we're going to restructure it, we're going to put you in a new position, whatever it might be. Actually that incident happened but this week at my work. My first reaction is to go out there and do exactly what all the other employees are doing. Oh, this is terrible, they can't ever decide on anything, blah, 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 all that. Start complaining and whinging, whereas that is actually my opportunity to show Christ in me. The difference that it makes. Because I'm not looking at my boss. I'm not looking at my employer. I'm looking at my God. My eyes are focused on Him, not on the people around me, not on the circumstances around me. If tomorrow I were to lose my job, the day after tomorrow God will look after me. God always looks after His children. Why? Because God promised. My God shall supply all your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. If God promised it, then God will do it. Because God cannot lie. My income is not what makes me survive. My job is not what gives me survival. My business is not what keeps me going. My, my, my salary that I get every week into my bank account, my allowance that I get, is not what feeds me. It's not what puts me in a warm, comfortable bed. That's God's provision. That's God's blessings. Why do you think we pray before we eat? Do you think you're eating because you paid the money for this conference, therefore that's my right? not your right. It's a blessing from above that you can eat. It's a blessing that you can eat. It's a blessing that you last night were able to sleep in a comfortable bed. It's a blessing. God provides for us. I never, ever look at the world as providing for me. Now, let's turn to this verse. Galatians chapter 6. And just for continuity, we're going to look at the three verses that we have focused on in Galatians. Galatians 2.20 to begin. I am crucified with Christ. Amen? The next verse. Galatians chapter 5. Verse 24. And they that are Christ 
have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. Now chapter 6. The last crucifixion. Chapter 6 and verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, accept or save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. By whom the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. This is a dual crucifixion. Can you see it? not a one-sided crucifixion. I am crucified with Christ. Those that are Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts. When it comes to the world, the world is crucified to me and I unto the world. That's two crucifixions in one. Yes? Because you're looking at me like, Two in one. Okay. And we want to look at each one. We have to look at each one separately. Firstly, why is the world crucified to me? That's the first part. The world is why is the world dead to me? Okay. Let's have a look. I want you to imagine that the world is Satan's playing field. God has allowed Satan to work within the realm of this world. Satan is called the prince of this world. The prince, the power of the air. He, he goes all over this world. He has all his forces all around this world working tirelessly. Finding the Christians. Locating them. Persecuting them. Causing difficulties. But like we said last yesterday, every single one of those things God must allow. I'm going to do this to the Christians that are sitting in Burma now after this cyclone. And the Lord says, yes, no. I'm going to go across to Iran and I'm going to persecute those Christians that are worshipping you in hiding and in secret. And the Lord says, yes or no. I'm going to come across to Sydney and I'm going to tackle this young guy at Campbelltown because he's struggling. And I want to get him down. I want to get him down further. And the Lord says, no. 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 You don't, you don't go to meet him. But then the brother sitting next to him, the Lord says, but him does. Because the Lord knows. There is a lovely verse. Let's read it. Romans chapter 8. people go through difficulties, difficulties, we always quote this verse. And we know, in verse 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. For whom He did foreknow, whom He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Now, 29 is a bit of a hard verse because it's got some words there with more than five letters and so we skip that verse normally. Okay? But in actual fact, there's a beautiful thing inside that verse. Right in the middle of it. Why does God cause things to happen and why does He do turn them into good? Can you see it in that verse? In verse 29, why does He allow these things to be happening? Because it happened to Christ, yes? Yes, but in, in the verse. Yep, that's right. It's like you're on exactly the right track. To conform. What does it mean to conform? Be like follow. It means like imitate. Yeah, imitate. It means like to take a piece of dough, a piece of clay, and shape it, squeeze it, till it looks like what you want it to look like. The reason that all things work together for good to them who love God, to them who are called according to His purpose, is because God wants to, through the Holy Spirit, make you look like Christ. He doesn't want to make you look like the new John. He doesn't want to make you look like a better and improved Cindy. 
He doesn't want to make you look like a Rami that's better than the old man, but like the new man. No, he wants to actually make you look like Christ. He wants you to be like him. The promise of this is found in another passage in scriptures where it says that when he comes and takes us home, we shall be like him. God is not working in your life to fix it up. God is working in your life to make it like Christ. That's very important. Very important for us to understand. It's not about repairing the bad. It's about becoming like Christ. Christ has no bad to begin with. So therefore we are dead to the bad. We are starting anew. That new man is like Christ. That new man, when he starts to affect your mind, your will, your emotions, you're like Christ. When that new man says, have compassion on your brother who's hurting. When the new man turns around and says, that sister that is burdened, go, go and see her, go and talk, call her. Then that is the character of Christ. That's in bringing out the emotions of Christ, the, what the Bible calls the bowels of Christ, the intentions of Christ, the desires of Christ. When somebody presents you with a dilemma, then you think like Christ. Have this mind that, that is in Christ, have it in you. Let the mind that was in Christ be in you. You follow them. You follow Him in practice. Why? So that you might be conformed to be like Christ. What the world does, but, is the world tries to take this person that's molded and it pokes it. It tries to distort it again. It says, okay, fine, you've got this person who looks like this piece of Plato and he looks like Christ, but if I just get him with something from the world, then, right? And then suddenly, he's got this massive dent in him. And Christ has got to fix that up. The Holy Spirit's got to change that because that's not like Christ. And what happens to us? The world is our surrounding. It's where we live. But it does not have a handle on us unless the old man inside says, okay, come. If you let out the old man, remember how we're talking about him being trapped? If you let him out, the first thing he will do is go to the back door of that house and open the veranda and turn around and say, invite the world in. First, why work on that? The more the merrier. That's his philosophy. It's just be one big part. So he, your inner man has an attraction to the things of this world. It's like magnetic. Like he likes the things of this world. Ah, oh, okay, let's be, let's be straight down, man. Eh? Like you listen to some of the music in this world. Like it's different. The tunes are different. Like they're appealing. The Word of God tells us that sin is pleasurable. Satan has been able to make sin and the things of this world look so appealing, so good, that you just think to yourself, I'm losing out if I don't take part of it. So all the world does is it presents its offering. Here you go. It's like a big department store. And if you walk in this department store with the flesh, with the old man, he will be on some sort of shopping spree. If you walk in there with the Spirit of God leading you, the new man, he will say, the world is dead to me. That thing in the world, that's worthless. It's worthless. Now, you got your Bibles ready? Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to... I want to read some verses with you together. And I'd like one person to put their hand up that they're going to open to that verse. I'll give you all the references. Those of you that uh, want to, you can write down these references so you can look at them later. But if one person can open up to one verse, just put your hand up. We'll allocate that verse to you and then we'll keep going. We're just going to read them. Very quickly. First one is Romans 3.19. Thank you, Ron. Next one is 1 Corinthians 3.19. Thank you. Um, thank you um, First Corinthians six two. Thank you. Uh, First Corinthians seven thirty one. Second Peter one four. One four. 
No one likes me. Yeah, okay, second Peter one more. Okay. Um, second Peter two twenty. Thank you. Okay. Let's um, first John five nineteen. We all we we had I think Brother Peter shared that verse with us this morning. First John five nineteen. That thank you. Okay. So we'll start with those. There's a few more. We'll start with those. Okay. Who has Romans three nineteen? Uh, now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. The whole world is held accountable to God. I want you to remember that phrase. The whole world is held accountable to God. Everything about this world, they must give an account for. Now I should explain to you that the world does not mean just this globe that's floating in space. This world is its system, its ways. Everything this world has devised, everything it's come up with, is actually against God. And, I, and we explained this to a degree yesterday, when we said, when the world was left to run its own system, like its judicial system, its courts, they took the Saviour and judged him as a sinner. When it was left in the hands of a democratic society, so people choose what they want, the people chose a murderer over Christ. The whole system of this world, even if it's religious system like the Jews and the Pharisees and all these people, they incited the people to say to the people, tell, tell the king, tell the ruler at the time, crucify him. So this world is built on a system that's against God. It does not have in every letter of its rules, this is against God, this is against God, this is against God. You won't find that. But it masks its rules. It's very good at hiding its rules. So what it does, it says, we want equality. We want equality across the whole. That means, men and women, don't worry about the roles that Scripture taught. Don't worry about the roles that God has set up. Just worry about equality. Equality. Don't worry about your roles. Don't worry about what God has assigned. Actually, doesn't matter. Whatever, whatever perversion, whatever sexual immorality you want to do, then you can do that. Because that's your freedom. That's your right. As long as you don't hurt anyone. As long as you don't harm anyone. But that's your right. Because we want that. People can go and do that in the name of art. They can turn around and do things that are blasphemous and horrible towards God. And yet we say that that is just freedom of expression. This is not right. This is the world that we live in. This is the world that we live in that turns around and it has no regard for another human soul. It can go and it can destroy thousands upon thousands of people. It can let one man dictate the destruction of over three million Jewish people. He can drive them in like cattle into a, into, a, into a hall and then he can gas them all. This is the world we live in. This is the best that the world could come up with. Actually, it's not even just starting from now. It started from the beginning of time. As soon as Adam and Eve came out of the garden, the first thing, four people on the face of the planet could not agree. Four people. If everyone went to a corner of the earth, they'd be fine. But they couldn't agree. Cain kills Abel. Murders his brother. And what does the Lord say when he calls out for Cain? He says, the voice of thy brother's blood cries out to me. It calls out to me. That's the world. That's what it does. God lets them start again. Don't worry about that. Let's take Seth. Let's keep going now. We get to Noah. The whole world... It's filled with one righteous man, Noah, and him and his family. One. <coughs> so God makes an ark. Noah goes into the ark with his family. And the whole world is in disobedience and rebellion against God. Why did God create it like that? God didn't create it like that. This is what man does. When you put something in, it's like me now taking something that's precious. And you put it in the hand of a child. You put it in the hand of someone who has means nothing. Like this ring. This ring means something to me. To you, it's a piece of jewelry. 
The only reason you would keep it is because either you didn't want to buy a ring for your future partner or because you thought maybe I could get something for it, some money for it. But really it's of no value to you. But in God's eyes, man was created in his image. Man is precious in the sight of God. When you take creation, when you take what God has made and you let man decide or man have some part to play, God wants to show us how bad man's heart is when it's left to decide for itself. Now I work in a bank and I'll tell you something. There is nothing more frail than the whole financial system that our world is hanging on. You know what? Our whole economy, the worldwide economy is hanging on strings that are wearing out. You, one string breaks, the whole economy can collapse. The whole world can be in, in absolute distress. Why is it that we can sit here in Australia and live this type of life, yet jump on a plane, go for 14, 15 hours somewhere else in the world, probably not even that far, go somewhere else in the world, and there are people that don't even have a place to sleep. People don't even have food. This is the world. This is the best that they could do. All that the world will ever do is make some people richer and stronger and more powerful and eventually make people weaker, poorer and rejected. But that's the beauty about Christ. Where the Word of God says that God shows no favoritism. The beauty about the Word of God is it doesn't matter who you are, you can come to Him. The beauty about the gospel of Christ is that even the thief upon the cross had no chance to live a righteous life was received into glory. This is the beauty about this message of salvation. It's not about separating, but it's about bringing together. The whole world is guilty before God. And they are guilty because they took the Lord Jesus Christ and crucified him. Okay. Don't worry, we're not going to talk about every verse now. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 19. Who has that verse? For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. So we explain that. The wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Think about the wisdom of this world. So that they can feed a few thousand people, they run a concert. They play some music. They collect some money. The things they sing about, the things they talk about, like it doesn't make sense. You pick up some of the lyrics of today's music and you wonder what possesses people to, to write that sort of stuff. I'll tell you what possesses them. It's definitely not just talent. It's definitely something behind that music. Okay, let's go to the next one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? Who's that? Who's the saints? Us. Now, if you want to really upset people, when you go home, open your car windows you're driving and say, we're going to judge you. No, don't do that. Okay? No. What it means, it means that this world one day when Christ returns as its rightful king, he will give to his saints to rule with him. So that they may see now what it means to have this world run with the Lord Jesus Christ at its helm. It will be a time of absolute Prosperity and calmness. It is the time in which the book of Revelation tells us, or the word of God tells us, that the lamb will sit with the lion and the two will be like at peace with one another. Wars will cease. Famines will cease. No one will go hungry. No one will go unnoticed. No one will be left alone. And the Lord will place us in a position where we are beside him. Now I want to tell you something. Why would you fall under the authority of the world when soon 
you will begin to judge this world. It does not make sense. Okay, let's have a look at the next verse. 2 Peter. Uh, 1 Corinthians, sorry. 7.31. And they who use this world are as not as using it for the fashion of this world is passing away. The fashion of this world, the tide of this world. Now, fashion doesn't mean the clothing of this world. Okay? Even though that's passing. Right? You guys, like, all you need to do is go back into your parents' closets, you know, and store that stuff because probably in 15 years' time that'll be what you're wearing. It, I know it sounds <laughs> horrific, but, you know, that's, that's the fashion. Like, things go around and so But things pass away. Things pass. The fashion, the tide, the things that today are so important, tomorrow are not going to be. The things that are of value, the things that are of focus, the things that everyone wants, today, it's gone. Like, we have some singers throughout history in this world that were at the top of their career. Today, they are at the bottom of their career. We have sportsmen, athletes, who are at, were at the top of their game, but today, they're nowhere to be found. The things of this world don't last. They never ever last. The money of this world, it doesn't last. The fame of this world isn't enough. It's, it just doesn't last. That's why celebrities are marrying, you know, faster than, you know, from one breakfast to another. Like, they, they just, they can't keep up. Because things pass away. Things pass away. The fashion of this world passes away. And the Lord tells us, that in Scripture. We did not need to see it today. It was happening in the Lord's time and before. Let's look at the next verse. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Now I want you to look at the real root, the real thing that's underlying spread through the world. Second Peter 1, 4. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and, pre and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. What's in the world? Corruption. You know when something's corrupted, it's ruined. Now, how many of you have ever had the challenge of buying a car? Okay. Now, when you went to buy a car, there's one thing here in Australia that's of utmost importance. You look for it. Because if it's got it, you don't want it. What is it? Price. Price. If you imagine that the corruption of this world is like rust in a metal, give it a coat of paint and it looks fine. But those of you that have ever owned a car and have seen rust as it begins to form, where does it begin forming? Like, does it just sort of one day, one morning you wake up and there's a hole in your roof? No. It begins to cause the paint to just bubble, sort of come up a little bit. It probably was working even before then. But now you're starting to see it. The corruption that's in the world, we are starting to see today. Everyone's doing something for their own benefit. They're doing it because they can. They're doing it because they're rich. Because they're doing it because they can. The system's just destroyed. Its fabric is destroyed. Okay, let's have a look at another verse. First John. Uh, yes, no, Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 20. So if they have escaped the corruption of the world through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, that word corruption is slightly different to the word corruption that was in the verse that we heard before. That word corruption actually means pollution. Something that's polluted. And some of your translations will have that word polluted. Okay, I want to look at this next verse which Peter shared with us this morning. 1 John chapter 5, verse 19. Who does that? Yes. Okay. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the, the evil one. Okay. We know that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. I want to look at a few more verses to do with who rules this world. Who governs this world. Let's have a look at them together. John 16. Let's quickly turn to these. 
John chapter 16, verse 11. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. So this world has a prince. Let's turn to Ephesians 6.12. Okay? Ephesians 6.12. That tells us, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. James 4 tells us, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? You are an enemy with God when you are a friend with the world. That's James chapter 4. In Revelation chapter 12, it tells us that this great dragon, Satan, deceives the whole world. Deceives the whole world. Now, I want to go back to our verse that says, The world is dead to me. Why is it dead? It is dead because it is finished. It is basically rotting away. And nothing will change that. Nothing will change that, my friends. Scripture tells us that this is part and parcel of prophecy. Christians are not going to change this world and make it into the kingdom of God. I'll tell you why. Because that defeats God's plan even in salvation. When you were saved, it was not your work, it was His work. You were born again. So likewise, at the start of the millennium, when the Christians are gone and taken home, and the world suffers for seven years, then and only then, when Christ returns, shall He restore peace in this world. When Christ returns, when He sits upon the throne, whether it be the throne of your life, or whether it be the throne of this world, nothing will be stable ever again. Until then. You want there to be peace in your life and rest? Let Christ sit upon the throne of your life. You want there to be peace and rest in this world? then that will happen the day that Christ sits upon His throne as the King of kings and Lord of lords. That's when it will happen. For that very reason, the Apostle Paul says, I do not boast in anything but the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, by whom, through which, the world is dead to me. The world is crucified to me. The world is nothing to me. I look at the world now and I do not find any reason to run after it. Think about the things that you and I love in this world. Why do we love them? We should not love them. Because they should be dead to us. The world, that smorgasbord of the world, that buffet of the world, should be horrible to us. It should be something that we do not desire, do not want. But there's a problem we do. We do. We do desire it. Now, why do we desire the things of the world? Because of what? It's not because they're actually good. It's because the flesh likes that. If you don't want to desire the things of the world, then don't deal with the world. Deal with Does that make sense? If you go away and say, right, that's, that's it, no more music, done, finished. Not listening to it, not going, not buying a CD, not going anymore. Not downloading illegally or legally anything from the net. No longer doing it. That is not your solution. That, that's not the solution. You're dealing with the world. But the fact that your heart is on these things can't be the new man, and it must be the old man. Therefore, the old man is still running around the house for it. Can't be. Can't be. The old man has to be dealt with. Don't deal with the world. Deal with the flesh. And the world will have no, no, no ability to come in, because no one's opening the door for it. Okay. That's the world dead to me. Now we come for the hard one. Me, dead to the world. When 
I look at the world, it looks like it's dead. When the world looks at me, it should see me as dead. That's what that verse is saying. I am, I am dead to the world. And the world is dead to me. I am dead to the world means the world looks at me and says, how can we get John? But we can't get anything out of John because John is dead. How is John dead? Because the old man that always opened the door for us, the old man that always let us in, the old man that always liked our things, that old man, he's dead. There's no one there anymore to open that door. But what the world does is it creates commotion. It stands outside the door and it bangs and it knocks and it yells. So now, take our analogy that we said yesterday, this house in which the old man is set up in that basement down the bottom. You are living in this house. And you can hear the old man rattling his chains, banging on the door, demanding just for you to open a little to him. But at the same time, you can hear the world outside, and the world is making a noise and a commotion. And all you want to do is just open that curtain just a little bit to have a look to see what's happening. And those two, the one in the basement and the one outside, are talking to each other. And they keep coming up with all these ideas and all these things to just make it harder. The old man says, look, if the world were to present more, offer more, then it would make my job from the inside easier. I'm going to borrow a phrase that a godly man called self. He called it the traitor within. What it does is you're stuck in the middle you got this old nature inside of you that's there even when the world is away from you. When you're lying in the quietness of your bed, when you're at a conference like this, the flesh comes with you. We're going to conference. Fantastic. Let's go. Lots of opportunity for the flesh at a conference. When that flesh, when you go back to the world, it says, okay, now we're, now we're back. Now we're back to familiar territory. And the world begins banging on your door. Let my things in. Let my fashion in. Let my lusts in. Let my desires in. Let the things that I love in. And the old man is going, please, please let it in. Please, just a little bit. Just a little bit let it in. We're going to have so much fun. It's going to be the best time of our life. It's not going to be like before. It's going to be different. And that's the old man. Now you can see the dilemma you're in. Is everyone upset now? Okay, you can see the dilemma you're in. But you should not be upset. You should not be upset. And let's have a look why we should not be upset. John chapter 16. If somebody can read for us, please. Verse 33. These things I've spoken to you, uh, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Can you read that last bit again? In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Is the world dealt with or not? Overcome. Yes. He has overcome this world. It's done. How do I make his victory become mine? That's the question. He's overcome it. How do I make that victory become mine? Let's turn to another verse in 1 John. 1 John chapter 5. Can somebody please read for us verses 4 and 5. Okay, I'm not an intelligent person, but verse 5 tells me, who is it that overcomes the world? Who? He who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. That happens when? When I'm born again. When I, be, when I give my life to Christ. 
the moment that you do that, you are already placed in a position that you have overcome the world. I reckon that's fantastic. I'm getting very excited. You have already overcome the world. Why do we live like we're trying to overcome the world? Why do we live like the flesh is still alive? We should live like the flesh is dead and the world is dead and Satan is destroyed and it's all coming to an end and that's it. The new man lives within me. The world is dead to me, but the, when the world looks at me, it says, he's dead. don't worry about him, he's dead. I can't get nothing out of him. I love that. I hope the world sees me as the, the foulest corpse. I the world looks at me and says, no, there's no way, there's no way, don't even go there. Throw whatever you want, don't worry about it, it's not going to happen. We've tried, for years we tried, when they were a teenager we tried so hard to get them into that music, we tried so hard to get them into that whole thing where they're concerned about like their image and the way they look, we're trying, we're trying to make them just look at our pictures and look at our, our you know, examples and try and be like and be like and idolize and worship, that's what we were trying to do, but this person, they were like dead, the world couldn't break through, it couldn't come in, they wouldn't even open the door a little bit. And that old man, he was trying to work, but he couldn't, he couldn't get anything done from the inside. We're trying to work from the outside. We are attacked from every side. But when you stand firm in the victory that God has given you, you are more than conquerors through Him who loved you. Now, we do know from the Scriptures that because of this, the world will hate you. Is that not right? Why will they hate you? Because you oppose it. Okay. And it opposes you. Good. Because I hated him. Because I hated him as well. Because you look like him. And it hates him. So it hates you. But if you don't look like him, it's not going to hate you. Is that fair? The more and more we show Christ, the more and more they hate. The more and more you, let's say, in that situation, uh, that example we gave where there's a, a change at work or some sort of restructure or there's pressures there, whatever happens, when you act in a way that's Christ-like, hang on, look at you, look at you, see. Always like, always saying, oh, it's okay. I'm a Christian, God will look after me. They want to throw up. They hate him. But God looks after you. And God gives you grace. And God leads you to something far better. But the world can't understand that. And in the same epistle of 1 John chapter 3, and verse 13, it says, I write unto the fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. We have overcome the wicked one. You know, the Bible tells us in other places, don't be surprised. Don't be surprised if the world hates you. Don't think it's a strange thing. I want to ask you a question. Would it be right for the world to love me, but hate my Savior? Would that be right? That's like saying now, in a small example, if the world hates my wife, but they love me, that's not right. But me and my wife are on the same level. But when it comes to my God, they hate Him, but love me. Something's not Something's out of whack completely. Now, I want you to look at these final verses with me in John chapter 17. In John 17, the Lord Jesus Christ is praying his intercessory prayer. 
This is where he spends time with the Father and he prays. And I want you to take notice of these verses. Verse 9. He says, I pray for them. I do not pray for the world. But for them which you have given me, they are thine. They are yours. I pray for them. Jesus prays for us. I, he does not pray for the world. He doesn't. But he reiterates that again. Look at a few verses later. Verse 15. In verse 14, he says, I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. You would ask, God, if our struggle is so bad, then why not just rip us out of this world? What about all the other people that I love? What about the sinners that are lost in their sin, that I'm calling and want them to come to me? Should I just send them to hell, now that you're free? Who is going to show me? Who is going to go and talk to them? Who is going to go and speak to these people that are lost? I'm living in your life and that's a gift that I've given you. But now I want to give that gift to others. I know the battle is hard, but that's why I'm praying for you. I know that you struggle, but that's why I'm there. I'm at the right hand of the Father. I'm your advocate. That if any man should sin, they have an advocate with the Father. Don't despair. Don't worry. Don't get upset to the degree where you, where you despair. No. If you do fall, not regularly, but if you do fall and you do sin, then you know that you are still loved by Him and in Him. Nothing changes that fact. You are a new creation after the character of Christ. You are born again by the very power of God. You are called to reckon yourself dead to sin, dead to the world, and dead to the flesh. And I tell you what, my brothers and sisters, now there is nothing that will happen in this world that could ever take you or pluck you out of His hands. Not even what you do. Not even how bad you are. Nothing shall make you, uh, take you out of His hands. But I tell you something. I tell you something that should, should excite you and give you a real desire and passion for the Lord. We are living. The battle is won. The battle is finished. There was a man who fought for the Japanese army for many years. He was hiding in a cave. Not knowing that the war was finished. He spent a further 14 years hiding in this cave. Thinking the war was still going on. When they tried to draw him out, he said, no, I can't, I'll get shot. The enemy's just outside. There's no enemy, son. They've been gone for 14 years. You and I should live with the knowledge that that battle is finished. It's done. The cross of Calvary solved it all. Christ solved it all. You as a Christian, identify with Christ. It's all being done for you now. All you're required to do. Go out there and walk like a victorious Christian. Walk like a Christian that their head up. Holding that banner of Christ. Not saying, oh, this is so hard. This life is so difficult. Oh, this is too tiring. The world is so tempting. The flesh is so, so strong. No, it's all finished. And daily you come to Christ and say, Oh Lord, it's all done. I want you to think about those beautiful words the Lord Jesus uttered from the cross before He gave up His Spirit. He said, It is finished. The transaction has been done. If it wasn't finished, He wouldn't have said it. In the epistle of 1 John, it says to us that the commandments of the Lord are not grievous. They're not burdensome. I don't look at the things that God tells me to do and I go, Oh, it's so hard. 
I can understand that if you were living in Moses' time with the Ten Commandments, yes, it's very hard. But not now, not under grace. Not under grace. I have this desire now to live for the Lord and to live for Him like never before. But please, just remember that verse in 1 Corinthians. For the God of this age has blinded the eyes of his people. The people outside, they are blind. Would you not go and help them open their eyes? Let them not see you, not even see your church. Let them see Christ in you. And then, ah, oh, then you'll be winning souls for eternity. Shall we pray? Father, we do thank you once again from all our hearts. We do thank you for the love which we do not deserve. We do thank you for the many blessings that you have blessed us with. And the greatest of these, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. How we do thank you, our gracious Father, that you did not leave us in this world alone. But you placed us into a family. You gave us the Spirit of God. You placed between our hands your perfect and holy word. And we do pray that we might live for you until that day you come to take us home. Lord, the battle rages outside in this world. And the battle is raging inside within us. But we do thank you that we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. I pray, Lord, for these young people that are here. I pray that they may go, truly Lord, from strength to strength. That they may walk in the victorious walk. They are victors through Christ. They are not conquered. We pray that you help those that are struggling with their sin. We pray, Lord, that you help those that are struggling with their flesh. We pray, Lord, that you help those that are enticed by this world. And take them back to the cross of Calvary. And where they see the blood that was shed for them. And they see the one who said, it is finished. We pray, Lord, that they may all walk in the newness of life. Desiring to please you, to love you, and to serve you. We do pray this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, um, you're very sad. Um, but we had, we had a fantastic time. Like, uh, I know you say, well, you can't tell you had a bad time. But no, I, really, we had a great time. We did have a really good time. I, I was just sharing with a couple of you guys in the break that there's, there's something very different about this group today than before. It, it's, it's great. It's fantastic. I can't really put my finger on it other than I can just see like a oneness in Christ. And uh, I think that I think that in any church that is the greatest of blessings. Like, people don't see you, they see Christ in you. And I think that's the greatest thing. So, you've encouraged us this week. You really have. Um, and I do pray that you will pray for me and Jackie and continue to pray for us. As likewise, we will pray for you. Um, and who knows? Maybe this will be the end of this conference, but we'll enter into our eternal conference forevermore very soon. So thank you very much and God bless you. Thank you. I'm just uh, going to finish off quickly with uh, just uh, having a look at the short video clip and then we wrap it up and uh, actually lunch is being brought forward from 1 to 12.30. So um, we'll just have a look at the clip